Okay, so good morning again. Uh, I'm very happy that the first of our special guest today is Jean-Francois uh, Cornu. Uh, just to say a few things about him. Uh, uh, Jean-Francois is a French translator. He's active uh, mainly in subtitling, but also translation of books on cinema and on arts. Uh, many of you uh, also know Jean-Francois as a film translation historian. Uh, he's known for his works all over the Europe, I think. And uh, probably you know his recent work, which uh, he co-wrote with Carol O. Sullivan, uh, which was the publication translation of films in 1900-1950, uh, published in English, so all of you are very welcome to have a look at this uh, interesting piece. Uh, Jean-Francois is also a very active member of AFTE, Audiovisual Translators Europe. Uh, we will speak about this organization a lot today. Uh, and he is also uh, a member uh, in, uh, of the uh, French Association of Audiovisual uh, Translators, ATA. We will mention this organization today as well. So uh, Jean-Francois, the title looks absolutely amazing, so for now uh, the floor is yours. Uh, just one practical thing, we will also have time for discussion in the end. Uh, in case you don't feel super confident asking in English, you can also ask your question in Slovak. And uh, my colleague Maria, you can see her over there, uh, will we'll interpret for you. Okay, so Jean-Francois, the floor is yours. Emilia. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if the title is as um, fantastic as you make it sound, but uh, I hope the presentation will be up to it at least. Um, I'd like to start with uh, comparing two images. Um, the first one is from here. You may have seen or heard of the film Roma. Uh, by Mexican filmmaker Alfonso Cuaron, which was uh, shown on Netflix earlier this year, and uh, with the um, subtitles in English, and then in other languages, in French, and quite a few other languages that were, to say the least, um, problematic. Um, I won't go into, um, I won't comment in particularly on those subtitles, but they were really problematic, but, um, Although this is the, supposed to be the up-to-date um, state of the art of subtitling and broadcasting on online uh, streaming, um, it has some problems. And if we compare it to this, oops, to this, um, the only thing these two pictures have in common are that they are black and white. Uh, the film by, by Alfonso Cuaron was deliberately shot in black and white and, and, and seen in black and white for artistic reasons. This is also a black and white picture because it was from 1931. Um, the, the subtitle you can see here is a French subtitle for the, for the 1932 release in France. And uh, the, by the way, the, the, the writer of the subtitles were the, was the famous writer Colette. Um, she didn't translate from English, from German to French herself, as far as I know, but then adapted a translation that was prepared beforehand. And you could think that um, the most recent modern digital subtitling that you've seen just before with, the, with Roma uh, would be a welcome evolution from what we could consider as primitive subtitles from 1932. Um, well, we have to question this, because as in other forms of history, the history of film translation is not about the a positivist evolution from the primitiveness of, primitiveness of the past to the sophistication of the present. Um, it's, it's wrong to think in those terms. To some extent, I think we could say that the, these 1932 subtitles, which you will get to see a clip a little later on, um, are much preferable to the disastrous 2019 subtitles for Roma, or at least the way they were done earlier this year. Um, but here we need to go back, to flashback, to the origins of film translation, uh, which started soon after the invention of cinema, which, as you know, uh, was invented in the mid-1890s. Um, and the translation of title cards, what used, used to be called title cards at the time, 
or which we call now intertitles. Um, and uh, this, the practice of translating or adapting um, intertitles to other languages started as early as 1905. So that's barely 10 years after the invention of cinema and, and just a few years after the introduction of intertitles because intertitles did not appear right from the beginning of films. They, they were introduced gradually a few years after the, uh, the beginning of cinema around 1901. And here, so you have a, a typical um, intertitle, in case some of you have never seen a, a silent movie intertitle. Uh, this is from a film which I will go back, uh, actually, at the very end of, the, of this talk. Um, the, the last uh, silent film by Alfred Hitchcock, actually, in 19, shot in 1929, but released in early 1920. Sorry, shot in 28 and released in 29. So this is a typical descriptive intertitle uh, for, um, for a silent film. And then when talking films started to be distributed in Europe in late 1928 and early 29 in France, um, uh, they needed to be translated, of course. So subtitling was the first form of um, talking film translation. It started Roughly in 19, the, the first experiments were done as early as 1929, and then it, it really took on from 1931, uh, just like dubbing did actually, because the dubbing, uh, which is the replacement of the original language and voice, voices by local ones, um, started in, um, there were experiments also for uh, German versions of American films in late 29, but then it really took on in 1931. Um, especially in France and Italy, and then in Germany a little later, Germany and Spain, and then gradually Central Europe and Russia as uh, talking films started to, be, uh, to, to expand, basically. Um, today, France, because obviously this is from, a, my talk is from a European perspective, but also from a French one, um, uh, France has a big dubbing industry. It had, right from the beginning, it started, it, it was quite big for a number of reasons. Uh, but it does have a, quite a large subtitling industry as well, because often this is often, outside France, it's often forgotten about. Uh, usually, the, the, um, a very basic view of things in Europe is that you have dubbing countries and subtitling countries dubbing countries being France, Germany, Italy, Spain, for, for the biggest. Um, and subtitling countries being smaller film industries like the Nordic countries, or Portugal, or Greece. Uh, but it, over time, especially in the last 20 years, it has changed. And a lot of countries, film industry, film industries, audiovisual industries, use both. Um, but in France, it's, it, subtitling has always been quite important. Um, now, I will give you a few examples and brief examples of what we in France consider uh, good film translation practices, especially as far as subtitling is concerned, although I will send, uh, show you a short uh, dubbed version into French, and thanks to the um, very clever sound uh, organization here, we will be able to hear the, the, the sound. Okay, I'll start with... Um, I'll, sta I'll start with uh, the French film subtitle into English and you can have an idea of what uh, it looks like. Oops. I'm not used to PCs, I use a Mac computer. Dire, euh, 
bah, petit. C'est d'ailleurs pour ça que je le dis. Oui. Votre annonce parlait bien de trois pièces, non Si, oui. Elles y sont Non. Deux, pas trois. Comment ça une grande, ici, disons, la principale. Puis là, une seconde, qui elle aussi a dû être grande avant qu'on la coupe en deux pour des raisons qui m'échappent. Bref, nous sommes devant une grande pièce et deux demi-grandes pièces. C'est bien ça. Vous pensez que la seconde a été... Regardez le plafond. Vous voyez bien qu'il est découpé en deux. C'est clair. Elle a été séparée en deux, elle aussi. Votre annonce aurait pu préciser deux demi-grandes chambres, deux demi-fenêtres et un plafond coupé en deux. Pour vous dire la vérité, nous avons reçu cette affaire récemment et. Dites-moi. So the film you've just seen, or the clip you've just seen, is. Um, a film by Alain René, French director Alain René. The original title is Coeur, which means, heart, which means hearts. But in English it's called after the, the play it was adapted from, uh, called Private Fears and Public Places by Alain, Alain Egborn. And the English subtitles you've just seen are by my colleague and friend Ian Burley, who's with us today. Um, and this is the, the example of good placement, good reading time, um, a, a, a keen sense of film language, which means that uh, the, the, the subtitles are as invisible as possible, which is what we try, try to, to aim for. And um, so this is usually what we go by in the French film industry, whether it's to translate French films into English or other languages, or foreign films into French. Um, now I'm going to show you what you've just started to see. Um, the, the same clip, clip from the same, f um, two clips from the same film. The, the, the subtitled version of an English-speaking film called Bride and Prejudice, which you may have heard of, which was a film from um, 2004. Um, it's a sort of transposition of um, Pride and Prejudice, the famous novel by Jane Austen, into an Indian context. Um, and I'm going to show you the subtitle versions, which I did with a, a colleague of mine called Elisabeth Chinest, and then the dubbed version, um, so that you also have an idea. Okay, so we'll go back to... Oh, you, you closed it, okay. So. Darcy Downing, you tear yourself away from the love of your life. You put some lotion on my back. I don't want to get too dark. I'm writing to my little sister, Georgie. Oh my God! You like that all this way? That explains why you haven't got much room for outfits. Do you have something against books? Or do you just resent them because they leave less room in your bag for your makeup? No. <laughs> no, I just never have time for them. Indians here have a lot more free time. Or maybe you're just a much more accomplished woman than I am. 
-hmm. Maybe. <laughs> This was to give you an example of the original version so that you have a better idea of what the, the French sounds like with the, with the dubbed version. But the, the subtitling we did was very, went along the same rules as what you saw with the previous clip, uh, the Alain René film. Whether you understand French or not doesn't matter, it's just you get an idea of the rhythm um, of the subtitles. And now it's going to be in French, so if some of you understand French, you will be able to to notice the slight differences between the original and the French version, but um, if you don't understand French, you'll get an idea of the lip syncing, which is occasionally very strictly adhered to or not. Ici, vous avez du temps libre. Ou peut-être qu'au fond, vous êtes une femme bien plus accomplie que moi. Mm -hmm. Possible. Okay, so I'm sorry that the sound was a bit low so that you could get an idea of what, um, how the, the lip syncing was done, but. Basically, with the, the close-ups, the, we are required to do as, as, as tight lip-syncing as possible, which means sometimes changing the, or altering more or less the original dialogue. Um, also, the fact that you saw both clips one after the other it's, is a little bit disturbing because you get used to the original voices, which are obviously different in the French version, especially uh, the, the main female character that you saw there. She has such a, a, a more high-pitched voice. Um, but when, when people see the, the dub version, they don't compare with the, with the original version, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, what is um, an, a feature of French dubbing is that, that in dubbing studios, uh, dubbing directors tend to insist on filling every mouth that, that moves on the screen, even though in the original version you might not hear anything. Uh, for example, the, the two characters that are in the, in the swimming pool, they don't say anything. You can't hear anything on, the, on the, the original soundtrack, but we were asked to write dialogue for that. So they, we had to write silly things that people don't really hear, because anyway, it's not a mixed as, as high. Um, as the, the, the main dialogue, but still, because you can see mouths moving on the screen, you have to, to add dialogue, which is pretty irritating um, from, from my point of view. Um, so, basically, you, had, um, you have an idea of what is being done now and what is supposed to be um, the reference. Um, I'm going to show you a clip from this 1931 film I mentioned earlier, the German film Mädchen in Uniform, uh, Young Maids in Uniform, um, which you saw uh, just a still of. And The, the setting is um, a boarding school for young girls in Germany, which is pretty strict. And this is towards the, the beginning of the, of the story, when a new boarder arrives and is introduced to the place by an, another girl. Um, so the film is in German, the subtitles are French, 
if, if you don't understand any of those two languages, it doesn't matter, again, it, you'll get a feeling of the rhythm and the placement and also the, the different, um, the, 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 the number of lines, which can go up to four sometimes in the subtitles. But remember, this is not early 1932. Okay, so obviously you can tell that these are very different practices from what we do today, um, especially from the uh, towards the beginning of the clip uh, when the, the 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 girl who speaks to the new one uh, introduces herself. She says, "Ich, he ich heiße Marga von Rasso." Uh, that you can you can read in the French title much um, earlier than what she when she says it. It's all grouped together with a number of sentences that are, uh, that are said. Um, but this was a practice at the time, and people, the audience didn't have a reference, apart from the intertitles of the silent era. So people didn't seem to mind. Uh, also, the thing is that the translation was done before the subtitles were actually put on, or the future placements and locations of the subtitle in the film were, were decided. So basically this is a some sort of summary, a summed up translation. All the secondary details or remarks or comments or jokes are usually untranslated um, and the, only the main gist of the dialogue is, is translated. But this practice di di differed from one country to another. For example, in this uh, French version, which seems to be, in terms of length and duration, similar to the original ger German version, which was shown in Germany, uh, there are about, as far as I can remember, 300 and 340 subtitles for a feature film which is about uh, 90 minutes long. Uh, today, I think you would have, it's not a very, very, wordy film, but you would probably have something like 700 or 800 subtitles. In Britain, at the same time, the, um, the prints that were released had only 150 subtitles for the same film. And in the US, I think it was 70. Um, this is all uh, my friend and colleague Carol O'Sullivan's research, which I'm quoting here. And it's, it's very interesting because at, at the same time, um, practices w would be different from one country to another and to what was expected of viewers to, 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 um, to be able to follow, basically. Um, we're going to move um, a few decades. Um, well, with a, a film from the 1930s, from 1939, but subtitled uh, 70 years later, in 2000, 2009, for uh, DVD publishing. This is a, a film called, uh, an American film called Only Angels Have Wings by Howard Hawks, uh, which was released in France most likely after the war, because the, uh, the, most of the 1939 films were not seen because of the, the German occupation, and then released from 1945-46 onwards. Uh, so the, the subtitles in French you're going to see are not the original 
uh, subtitles, but uh, subtitles done for the DVD uh, edition in 2009. Um, if you don't know the film, basically it's a, it's a story of, um, of it's made mostly a male story, uh, men transporting nitro uh, dangerous goods, including nitroglycerin, on planes. And you will see that in this clip, uh, it, 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 they only talk about this. But uh, my point is the, the, the very end of the clip. Well, that's fine. What's up? The weather bureau reports a new low formed out on the ocean. It's going to bring that storm to the north right over here. When do they expect it? They might get the first of it tonight. How big? I don't know. I'll get you some more dope later. I'm time for dirty weather. Poor touchy. There's no use warning about that now. Get out on the field. Help Mike and Pancho with that new ship. Well, what could that do if the storm hits? Tell them to stay with it all night. Yeah, someday I'll get a straight answer from you, and I won't know what to do with it. Oh, sure. Hey, Jack. Wait a minute. What? The loading number eight with nitroglycerin. That's right. It's digging into the oil fields on your way out. Hey, Baldy, anything you've got. Hey, listen, Jack. Jack, we aren't supposed to fly that stuff with the mail. I know we aren't. There's nothing in my contract that says that I fly nitroglycerin. Well, you're getting a buck and a half a mile for doing it. Not me. What? Say, listen, Jeff. I saw a guy blow a tire once. I was cleared out to the other end of the field and they broke a bottle in my hip pocket. Where's your map? I don't like that stuff, Jeff. Who does? This can't help it. You know me. I'll do anything else. I know. Hey, I'll McPherson. Once you're through the pass, the oil fields are about 200 miles north. Give me a match, Dutch. You weren't kidding me the other day, were you? Dutch, figure out Jen's time. What? What did you say? You're through, Jen. What's the matter with you? Oh, wait a minute, Jeff. You can't blame that boy. I'm not blaming him. He's fired, that's all. Sorry, Jen. Oh, no, Jeff. I don't like that. That way you... Dutchy, how about clearing the field before McPherson takes off? Huh? Nitro. Oh, my goodness, Jeff. You said it. I didn't think of that at all. How's this stuff packed? All in rubber. Here's a trap door if you want to get rid of it. Thanks. Okay. So compared to what you saw before uh, with the English subtitling and the French subtitling of the, the previous clips, you, I hope you can tell the difference. Um, first of all, the, the, the rhythm is not good. Uh, some subtitles stay too long, like when Cary Grant says, I know, you have je sais, which is literally I know, which, is, which stays a bit too long. I mean, you, you don't need so much time to read it. And other parts are a bit too quick. Uh, they, 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 they don't fit with either the sound rhythm or the, the, the rhythm of the picture, basically with film editing. And what's most more is that um, this is quite um, a while into the film. We're probably about two thirds into the film, so we know as viewers that they're carrying nitroglycerin, which is a highly dangerous and explosive substance. Even in this clip, which is only uh, less than two minutes, they've been talking about it constantly. And suddenly, we have this title, which appears, that tells us uh, this is nitroglycerin in French. And the, the French and the English are very close, because only the, 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 the final E in, 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 in English doesn't exist. Um, so this is ludicrous. The other thing is that um, because of DVD publishing, which has been then imitated and copied by uh, online streaming subtitling, um, whenever you have something on screen, and in uh, uh, the, the headline of a newspaper, a letter, or here, uh, some sort of writing, as in here on the box, subtitles have to appear, especially if they are in the bottom part of the, the picture, subtitles have to appear at the top. Which, is, which can be sometimes uh, good, because reading um, a subtitle over something which is already written on screen might be annoying. But here, 
first of all, as I said, we, we know that they're talking about nitroglycerin. Um, the difference between English and French is not that big that you wouldn't understand it. Um, and in terms of editing, this should appear, if, if you insist on having such a title, it should appear much earlier, in, uh, as soon as you see the box, basically. Or, um, yes, and then it doesn't take into account uh, the fact that then the, the, the final shot when the, the pilot turns around uh, with a sort of uh, weary look at the, what he's carrying, um, we know already that there's no point in having all this. I'm going to cut it short a little bit here. Um, but basically, to sum up, we have a summary of what not to do um, here, which is always good to, to, it's always good, it's like bad films, it's, al it's always um, useful to, to watch a bad film because then you know what a good film is. So it's the same with, this, with subtitling and translation in general. Um, so there's no consideration to image composition. The text is redundant. Um, and, and no consideration to film editing. And I mentioned that this practice of having um, subtitles at the top, it's because they use uh, DVD, multinational DVD uh, subtitling companies use what are called templates, which are a sort of model that has to be um, used for translation into any kind of languages. Um, for example, I go back. Um, this is the menu for another Alfred Hitchcock film called To Catch a Thief. And here, you don't have to count them, I've counted them for you. There are 25 languages. And which means that every language, whatever its form and whatever it, the way you would translate, whether it's, in, it's into Dutch or into Hebrew, you would have to fit in the same very strict, um, what we would call in French, spotting, which, we, which you can adjust if if you need to, to have a good translation and you need a three or four frames extra to make, it, to make a subtitle slightly longer for the sake of a good translation, of course without going too much o over time, um, then it's good for the translation. But with this kind of very, uh, it's like a straight jacket basically that you have to force languages into and it's usually not very satisfying. Um, Okay, I'm going to do a, a, a flashback to the beginning, both of the beginning of, um, of, of translation almost, and to the beginning of this talk. Um, um, not yet, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yes. And I'm going to go back to the silent film I mentioned earlier, this the, the, the Alfred Hitchcock film called The Manxman. <coughs> I won't see this either. Okay. You may remember the, 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 intertitle, the intertitle I show you, showed you at the beginning. Um, it mentioned the characters' names, Philip, Christian, Basically, there are two men who are in love with the same woman called Kate, played here by a famous um, German-Polish actress called Annie Ondra, who was famous in the silent era, um, and who played in two of Hitchcock films. Um, and basically, uh, she's married to a Christian, whom you can see here through the window, uh, he was a sailor, he went away for a while, he was thought drowned at sea, and uh, Kate had a baby with Philip, who is in this scene as well. And she's, she, she has to say that she's pregnant to her husband, but she doesn't dare to. Eventually she says it, and the husband thinks she's pregnant from him, but no, it's from the other man, and she still doesn't dare tell him. So, because this is a silent film, you're going to see one or two intertitles, but then there's something really special that you have to take very um, 
you have to look at very carefully. And we can switch off the sound. And he's just come back from from the dead, basically. So this is, this is the very, very end of uh, silent cinema. And Hitchcock was about to start on his first uh, talking films called Black May. But here, as in other films, as, as in other films of, the, of the late period, of the late 1920s, you have an, ex an example of not using intertitles, but being able to convey to the audience what the actors are, actually say. Because often, most of the time, they would actually say the lines. Sometimes they wouldn't, and then only the, the, the deaf people were able to read on their lips and say, well, this, this was wrong. They would laugh in a, in, a, in a sad scene, for example, because they could decipher what the actors were saying. Uh, but here she, she says, I'm going to have a baby, and the, the directing is extremely clever because you have this black coat hanging in the background, which helps us to have read her profile in a, in a perfect way. Now, well, what am I talking about here? Because there's no translation involved, um, and this is a silent film. Well, the link is, um, if you have to, because you saw that the intertit intertitles were subtitled into French as well. So what do you do with this? Do you translate or don't you translate? This is a translator's dilemma. To subtitle or not to subtitle? Um, okay, so I don't have a definite answer for this. You could translate it, um, but at the same time you're sort of going against the fact that this is a silent film and you're reintroducing written written element. Um, but then it has implications for even for talking films. Um, does every single line in a, in a film has to be subtitled, even today? Uh, it wasn't always the case in the in the 1930s and from the 1930s to the 50s. Uh, with computing, video, and digital subtitling, the number of subtitles in a film has increased over the last 25 years or so. But sometimes also because of such ludicrous uh, choices as in the subtitling for only angels have wings, suddenly you have too many subtitles which are redundant, um, useless. So, in, in our translator's practice, in our audiovisual translator's practice, with each new line to be subtitled, uh, we wonder whether it's worth being subtitled and, uh, and how to go about it. Because there is no set rule, basically. It's every, every time, every new film or every program is a new case in itself, and even the, each line is a new case in itself. So, with concluding remarks, um, I, and to remain within the theme of this conference, the overall theme of the conference, which is the role and function of language in the 21st century, um, I would say that that function isn't just about immediate communication. The function of language, language is, as in previous centuries, to convey human creativity. And in their task, audiovisual translators aim to be as creative as possible in writing subtitles or, or dubbing dialogue, always making sure they take into account the intricate relationship which links the image, the spoken dialogue, and the sound effects. And this is 
the specificity of audiovisual translation. This is what I strive to do in my everyday practice, and this is what I hope I was able to present to you today. Thank you. If you want to know more about this, as Emilia very kindly mentioned, uh, there are two books which are one I wrote and the other I contributed to and co-edited. Uh, so these are the references. And for the one in English, the one at the top, I have a um, special little discount thing here. Um, this is self-promoting, I know, but the, the publisher isn't doing much to, for that, so we have to take things into our own hands. And uh, the, 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 the selling price is fairly high, but you will have a fairly good discount with, with this if you're interested. But no need. No, no, you don't need to buy it. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, jean Francois. It was very interesting uh, for me. I'm sure there are a few questions in English or in Slovak, uh, as we said. Uh, so, is there anything the audience would like to ask? Thank you very much for your presentation. And I would like to ask you concerning development, uh, because you look at the things from historic perspective. Uh, do you think that dubbing will eventually die out with new technologies and Netflixes and different perception of uh, young people, for example? Or do you think that it will persist? Thank you. That's a trick question. Um, I think it will remain, I mean, it will stay, f I'm sure, for a while. I mean, I know that the younger generations are much more exposed to subtitling and, and attracted to the original versions through series and then through um, Netflix and other online platforms. But Netflix is opening, is, is, is getting more and more interesting, interested in dubbing and it's actually setting up um, dubbing facilities in Europe now. So they know that um, a large, well, a fairly large amount of viewers have been used to dubbing, even among younger generations, because the younger generations who like dubbing are usually those who do more studies for longer for longer periods of time and I know younger people who don't like subtitling and they will go for dubbing for dubbed versions in France um, so I think the, the the countries where the film the dubbing industries have been have been have a long tradition that we, I think they're, 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 they're last uh, I don't know for how long but uh, I'm sure they will last I have a question, Jean-Francois, if I may. Yes, uh, you mentioned uh, subtitling versus dubbing. This is an endless discussion. Why in some countries this and why in some countries the other? One of the arguments is, which uh, I read in many publications, is that uh, dubbing uh, was prevalent in countries with totalitarian regimes. I do not quite agree because I would have a lot of arguments, like France, for example, <laughs> So what's your opinion about that? Why? Do, do, do you agree with this, this argument that uh, this was because, you know, in dubbing you can convey certain things and sometimes you can just cut out things or you can translate it differently, which actually happened in Czechoslovakia during socialism that sometimes, you know, if you had uh, a mention about Russians, then it was uh, replaced by something else. But I do not think that dubbing was prevalent in Czechoslovakia due to the fact that we had communism. So what's your opinion about that? Well, I, I have facts more than opinions. Um, it, it is true to some extent that dubbing was used for ideological reasons and censorship. Um, in Italy, for example, where it was first widely used, it was definitely to impose Italian, uh, not necessarily the fascist ideology, although I mean, to some extent it was, but it was also for linguistic reasons. Uh, there's an excellent uh, researcher called Carla Mereu Keating in, in Britain, who's Italian, who's been working, researching a lot the, the, the origins and the, the, the history of Italian dubbing. 
and she showed that um, it was mostly for linguistic reasons, well, ideologically oriented, of course, but um, right from the silent era in Italy, um, some sort of mainstream or, or standard Italian was trying to be imposed on a country which was not at all linguistically united, uh, and, and cinema was used for that. Obviously, with, with the fascist regime, they also imposed a use dubbing for, for ideological reasons. The same happened in, in um, Spain from the time that Franco uh, became the, the dictator, uh, but that was a little later, more like the early 40s. And as to France, as far as I know, and as far as my research um, was able to, to lead me to evidence, there was no officially politically, politically motivated use for dubbing. It was more um, for commercial reasons. The, the, in the early 30s, the idea was to try and have as much films in French shown in, in cinemas, because um, the, the American sound films were the, the dominant um, origin of talking films, and, um, and, and actors needed to have work as well. Um, so it was a way to provide work for, for actors, although there were divisions within the acting community because some thought dubbing was completely um, wrong. Uh, it was wrong to lend one's voice to other people's bodies. Uh, but m most actors did, did uh, agree to, the, to this. Um, you read in some f um, books in French about the history of, 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 of that period, you do read that it was also for ideological reasons, but I have found no official evidence of that. Um, so, I did, it doesn't mean that it was not used in, for that, in that purpose at some stage, but I, have, I haven't found, or I don't know of, um, examples of, of such use in France. Yeah, thank you, because uh, the practices may have differed, because in Czechoslovakia, also from what I know about, you know, 1980s, 1970s, especially on TV, when there was a film that was really, you know, sort of fishy, it was not um, uh, approved by, you know, uh, the communist regime, there was something uh, very courageous about the film. Usually the film was shown with subtitles, because the language, you know, the, the knowledge of language was so poor that, uh, 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 the licensors thought that maybe this is the best, uh, best way how to show the film with subtitles and of course the subtitles then could have been scarce. So if there was something problematic it wasn't translated and then the film would be shown at I don't know 11 o'clock at night you know as a for the you know for special viewers for special viewers cinema something like that so whenever there was something problematic it was subtitled on TV not translated as, as for dubbing. So there might, might have been a different practice, which, is, which has to do with, uh, with the language knowledge, I think. Uh, I got three questions, perhaps you know, technical ones. In one, I think it was the German uh, film, there were two names of translator, you and uh, a lady. And there was uh, written French subtitles and a dubbed version. Does it mean that the film was released in two versions, one, in sub with subtitles and the other one is a dubbed is a dubbed version. It's one one question. Yes, it's actually the the British film called Bride and Prejudice from 2004. Mm -hmm. uh, it was myself and a colleague who did the translation. And m most films in France are released in both versions, uh, dubbed and subtitled. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and, and the, the second the, one is about the subtitles which were up on the screen. Uh, I didn't see the reason why to do that, except the subtitle, with, well, there was the insert nitroglycerin, because there was nothing else down, down on the screen, so why was it up? So that's why, the, the, the one, that's okay, not to uh, somehow disturb or what. But and the third question is uh, the number of subtitles which you mentioned that in some, uh, some languages uh, there was a big gap, uh, quite a huge gap between uh, 100 and 
900, was it for the same film? In different languages, the same film? So I don't understand. In the full length film, it has about 700 up to 900, or when they speak very much, so even uh, more than 1,000. So why such differences? To answer the, your second question about the, the placement of the subtitles at the top, I, I'm like you, I think it's ludicrous. I mean, unless it's really uh, bothering or annoying to read a subtitle over something that's already written and that needs to be read on screen. Uh, you maybe do, you, you could do it once, but as you mentioned, not for every single subtitle that appears while there is some, something written on the screen. Um, I, I totally agree, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, it, it, it's because it's too systematic that it becomes really a problem in the use of templates. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> now, as to the number of subtitles uh, differing for the same film in different languages, you have to remember that this, this is the, the very early period, uh, the early 1930s. Um, a, a film was subtitled or translated into a language according to the country's own practice. There was no, um, it, it was not the same people who looked after the translation into uh, any number of languages. So in France, they decided that they needed so many subtitles for the French version and for the French audience. In Britain, they, they did it a different way. Um, it, it, it doesn't look very consistent, but that's the way it is. Then later, when films were retranslated later, a couple of decades later, then, or even for today, for the, the for proper DVD editions, like such as um, the American company Criterion does, they do it very, very carefully, and they very they, they put a lot of care into the, the the placement, the rhythm of the subtitles, the content of the translation, of course. So you would have more um, subtitles for for the German film that you see that you saw, for example. But there, it it was it was not um, it was not deliberate that you would have less subtitles in English and more in French. It was completely it was still a bit experimental. 